needed to keep his phone tonight <laughs> because it is such a tight space. And we'll be here looking at the front walk in. But I just want to welcome uh, Trisha Hoffman. Uh, she's a photographer and an arts administrator. Many of you probably know her as the executive director of the New Space Center for Photography, which is an educational, cultural nonprofit um, that really focuses on photographic education um, and uh, provides space to uh, sort of build community around photography. So it's a great, great resource here in Portland. Um, she has a long history in nonprofit management and has previously uh, worked at Blue Sky and Photo Bethesda. And she holds an MFA in photography from the University of Hartford. So welcome, Tricia. Thank you. Talks. Thank you, Stephanie, for the introduction. Um, and thank you all for coming out this evening to hear me talk about um, what is one of my favorite pieces here in the collection. Um, I'm actually going to talk about the, the entire book, um, which is uh, see, it's the album titled Photographs of the Columbia River and Oregon. Um, it was produced in 1872 um, by Carlton Watkins. And uh, the book itself, is it's very rare. It contains 51 albumin prints um, made from mammoth plate glass negatives. And the specific image that the book is open to right now, um, titled Ruins of the High Bridge Cascades, Columbia River, um, was taken in 1867. Um, in addition, some other examples of Carlton Watkins' work is, are here in the gallery. Um, this is Oregon City, and this is uh, Cape Horn, I'm trying to remember, rounding Cape Horn. Um, so to understand the photographs, the, all of the photographs um, in this body of work, uh, I wanted to give a little bit of background about the artist as well as some historical context. Um, so Carlton Watkins, he was born in Oneota, New York in 1892 um, and was the eldest of eight children. Um, something that I found interesting, eight, 1829, not 1892. Um, just two years prior to his birth, um, Joseph Nisiphor Neeps um, developed a small portable camera and coated paper in bitumen and silver chloride, thus producing the first photograph. So just two years prior to his birth, the, really was the beginning of photography as a medium. Um, and the interesting piece about that, the photograph took eight hours to expose, and then the image, would, the image actually faded very quickly from the paper, so it was not, um, as stable as the processes that came after that. Um, so if you fast forward 22 years to 1851, um, the, 19, the 1849 gold rush in California had uh, lured Watkins to the west. So he first landed in Sacramento and then ultimately ended up in San Francisco. Um, he started out delivering materials to the gold mines as well as working at a store clerk um, but then he was noticed by a nearby photography studio manager um, who thought he was very charismatic and was hired to pretend to be a photographer because the studio photographer quit suddenly and as a portrait studio, they didn't want to lose out on the business, um, but they could still make the images, so they hired him to pretend to be a photographer. Um, and he actually turned out to be quite good at the at the process and um, picked up the, the medium really quickly and went on to become the photographer who made these images. Um, so I thought that was really funny that he was hired to be a fake to start with. Um, so at that point when he, was, when he was learning photography, he first started out with daguerreotype, which was a really complicated and very hazardous process um, involving mercury vapor, which we all know is pretty toxic. Um, and right around that time is when the wet plate collodion process was developed. And that's actually what was used to make all of these images. Um, it was considered a lot easier and more convenient. However, um, how many people know how the wet plate process works? Anyone ever? A little bit? Um, well, the basic description is you start with a plate and you coat it with um, collodion, which is about the consistency of 
of pure maple syrup. So it's um, sticky and viscous. And so you're balancing this and coating your plate, and then you have to dunk it in silver nitrate liquid while it's still wet, get it into the camera, expose it, and process it while the whole thing is still wet. So it's actually still a very complicated process, which I think of every time I look at these prints. Just to get the negative ready to capture the image is in itself um, an arduous task. Um, in addition, it's a contact printing process. So the negatives would be the size of the actual image. You'd make a negative, lay it flat on the paper, and expose. The only way for Watkins to get this size print, which was his desired size, was to use a negative that big. So he actually went to a cabinet maker in San Francisco and had a camera custom built to accommodate the negatives that he was um, wanting to use. They're like 18 by 22 inches. Can I just ask, did you have a mirror so that you would reflect the image down onto a flat plate? Or you would actually have to put the plate in vertical? Vertical. There, there are holders, so he would have like a wooden frame, um, kind of like a big wooden picture frame that has a, a big um, slide that goes in front of it. So you drop your plate in, cover it with the slide, put it in the back of the camera, pull the slide out, and then, so the, let's see, backing up, the um, NEEPS process was an eight hour exposure. Daguerreotypes could take up to 30 minutes, and wet plate was so exciting because it only took 20 seconds-ish up to five minutes. So you'd take the lens cap off the camera to expose it, cover it, put the dark slide back in, take the whole piece out, and then take it into your dark room on site and process it right there. Yeah. So still a really complicated process. And then when you look at where he's standing to get this picture and think about what it took to haul all those glass plates up there, haul the camera, make the picture, and get it developed, um, I find it really fascinating that he was able to accomplish all that he did. I think. He was in Oregon maybe for less than a year when he produced these images. So 51 prints captured during this trip. I mean, that's to me pretty significant for this kind of process. Um, at the same time, he was also working with um, stereographic images. So for those of you that haven't seen, um, you, it, you'd take two images. I think there were cameras that both would take two images side by side, side by side negatives. And then I think some people would also take a single image and then place them side by side. So you'd print them side by side on a card and then that would go into a viewer. And so you'd look through and it would create a three dimensional image. So um, he was doing that at the same time and I think he made, I have to refer to my notes. Um, on this trip he made 139 stereographs and I guess 59 mammoth plates when he came to, to photograph here in Oregon. Um, I have to catch up to my notes. Uh, he actually started between um, the portrait studio and the Oregon photographs. He initially started out um, doing commission work for local investors, what today would be the equivalent of our venture capitalists, but these guys, their um, venture was in California land, both prospecting for gold, other min minerals, as well as just real estate. So he was initially making images um, to demonstrate the the positive aspects of industrialization. He did a lot of photographing in mines, and he also was photographing um, for the purposes of land claims. So as people sued each other over land, he was the guy that went and took the um, documentary images um, to be used in court. So I, I think that's interesting when you look later at his later work. Um, I think how he was applying his early training to marry um, industrialization and the natural landscape and show them uh, functioning together in a positive light as opposed to a lot of folks who are photographing and trying to show um, the horrors of what industrialization was doing for the area. Um, so he made 
he first made a trip to Yosemite in 1861, and then he came to Portland in 1867. And the images in Yosemite, those were his first real landscape images, um, and I think ones that he's maybe become most well known for. Um, and they were used by uh, President Lincoln to set aside the land in Yosemite Valley and preserve it. And that initial act of preservation then was used in the early 1900s to start the uh, national park system. So his, his images sort of laid the groundwork for that effort. Um, so when he came to Portland, he was uh, specifically focused on making images along the Columbia River. But in the late 1860s, uh, there weren't through roads. So most of this work, he's traveling with all of his cameras, he's traveling with his glass plate negatives. Um, most of that travel along the river was made by steamship, barge, and then rail to cross some of the larger um, impassable areas. Um, and on that trip, he actually made some of the first photographs of what we now consider some of the most iconic landscape images in the area. He was one of the first people to photograph Multnomah Falls. He was one of the first people to photograph um, Castle Rock, which was now known as Beacon Rock, as well as Cape Horn, which this is one example of um, his Cape Horn images. Um, so the work here in the book and also on the wall really demonstrate his technique as a photographic technician. During that era, um, photography kind of hovered on the edge of a technical practitioner's medium and a creative medium. And I think Carlton Watkins sat at that intersection where he was definitely a, a technician in his application of the process, but at the same time, he was one of the few people who were making these landscape images of the West with an eye for, um, with an eye for beauty and with some intentional uh, effort to marry that, the industrialization that's happening. You know, he's, in, he's not carving that out, but he's also not showing um, man's insertion into the natural world as an aggressive act. Um, and I think that's a little different than some of the other people who are photographing. He was also doing this of his own accord. Um, at the same time, there were a lot of land surveys that were taking place. Some were funded by the federal government, some were funded by um, local municipalities or uh, what became sort of the park system. And he was doing this on his own. He was primarily a, an independent businessman throughout his entire career. Uh, he wasn't a particularly successful businessman. In fact, he, um, I think he miscalculated the field. And in the late 1870s, as a lot of the um, survey landscape photography was happening, there became a, a far greater competition in the field of, I mean, he was selling these prints. He was selling the stereographic prints um, and making, I think, a fair deal of money. However, there was a huge, uh, decrease in the value during the late 1860s, and he wasn't prepared for that. And ultimately, he went bankrupt and had to sell his negatives. Um, one of the buyers started reprinting them over under his own name and uh, ultimately pirated the work. Um, so that was a huge blow to him in his career. Um, but he did come back to Oregon in the 1880s, interested in photographing some of the areas that he hadn't shot before. I don't think any of those are in the book um, since it was printed in the 1870s. Um, but he, I, I didn't find it online, but apparently he photographed some of the first huge snowstorms in Oregon um, because it just happened to be here while he was um, up to photograph. Um, so I guess part of the thing I find most interesting, well, I'm particularly drawn to his work for two reasons, both his technical proficiency, given how challenging the process would have been, and I think also for personal reasons. Um, when my husband and I moved out here, 
Um, well, actually, when I was preparing this, this presentation, um, I went back to my undergraduate photo history text. Um, for anyone who's interested, it's Mary Warner, Mary Warner Marion's Photography, A Cultural History. Um, and I realized that uh, Carlton Watkins, the only image from his body of work um, was uh, Cape Horn near, near, I don't know if it's Salilo? Salilo. So that image was the only image I had. That would have been my first introduction to his work. And I remember specifically when my husband and I moved out here about five years ago. As you drive along 84 heading into Portland, you see the reverse of that image. And it was such a surreal experience to be confronted with that. Because, I mean, things have changed, but the railroad tracks are still there. The huge embankment is still there obviously the Columbia and looking north to um, the mountains in Washington. So it was just a really interesting and surreal experience. Um, and I've been interested in the re-photographic survey project, which was started in the 70s. A group of photographers went back and they traced the footsteps of um, some of the other early landscape survey photographers. And Excuse me. Went and found the actual location of their their first photographs and rephotographed from that exact vantage point. So I found it really interesting as we're entering Portland to be kind of confronted with that experience. And then I think it was on my first trip to the museum here. Um, this book was actually on display, and it was a really interesting thing to then see some of the Im images in person. Um, I don't know how many of these are in existence anymore. There were three. There were three made. Yes. I, I didn't find that, and I don't know who else, if anyone else, owns one of these at this point. They, they might have been cut apart and sold separately. So wow. the, the fact that the museum has that was a really, or, and had it on display, was a really, um, was a really important thing for me. It's an amazing story how this thing actually came to the museum. <coughs> Do you want to share? I don't, I don't know that story. Guy would have to back me up on this, but um, <coughs> this was originally commissioned for a steamship company in California that was <coughs> uh, the, the main form of transportation was steamships up and down the rivers. And mm -hmm. So this was a survey project uh, to document the territory. Mm -hmm. And as I said, they made three copies of it from what I said. Is that right, Guy? Uh, I don't know. Oh, that, that well, that's, that, that's what I remember from Terry's talk. Yeah, and uh, I think the state of California had, or the steamship company, uh, uh, called up, uh, uh, or was it the state of California has had it, called up um, the uh, Oregon State Library and asked them if they wanted this book that had been lying around uh, on, a, on a shelf for, for decades because mm -hmm. they didn't know what to do with it. And so the, the, the library said, sure, we'll, we'll take it off your hands. And so it was lying down there in, in Salem for another few decades until... Well, they didn't know what to do with it, and um, they called up to, I think, the Art and Historical Society and, and uh, I think, the museum and, and said, well, it, it, it it's, needs to be restored. Mm -hmm. And the museum was the obvious place to have it restored. So they said, w would you like to the project? And they said, well, well sure, why not? And that's the, this is the piece that brought Terry to the museum, because he was the one that was... Interesting. It's funny, because doing the research, I realized as I would get to the... At, as I would get to the um, bibliography on things that Terry actually had written a lot of the things that I read as I was preparing this. So um, I, I did recognize his, uh, <coughs> excuse me, his interaction with this. And it makes total sense given, I'm sorry, um, given his interest in landscape photography and Western landscape photography. The fact that he's a geologist. You know, he was a geologist. Yes, so. yes. And, that was the premise for a lot of the survey work was under the, um, not this specific one, but some of the other survey work that was done in this region was under the auspices of the um, government for geological survey purposes. Um, so at any rate, uh, I think his work stands out from a lot of the other survey work because of the way he's marrying his technique and blending. Um, I was looking through 
these specific images on display and kind of thinking about how he chose his perspective. And in a way, um, all of the built structures are kind of nestled within nature as opposed to in some of in some other examples, it they're portrayed more um, as dominating the landscape. And he would have been thinking about getting above or getting over. I just I think his his camera positioning was very intentional in order to show the two at peace together. And I think that was really a big component of the image that I remember from my photo history book. Um, it's a very calm, placid image with just a faint trace of the railway, railway going through the center of it. Um, and you know, my fantasy was that that was going to be the image in here, but I um, didn't get to pick what was in the book. And the book itself makes me really happy that it, it's here intact and available for public viewing. I'll just say that it is considered the most important documentation of the Columbia Gorge at that time in existence. Well, I mean, he was the first person to document a lot of it, so yeah. I would imagine it would be considered the most important. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions? Yes? I was just going to say the other technology you're leaving out is the railroad, because mm -hmm. it's in so many of the photographs themselves. These are trestles that aren't as presently occupied or as the trains going through, but it's something made me really realize that clear cutting wouldn't have been possible without the railroad. And it brought people up and, and I realized, oh, those early landscapes, we have those iconic landscapes, those are railroad landscapes. That's, well, that was his primary means of accessing it. Mm -hmm. You know, he would travel along part of the, the, railway, the railway to gain access because there weren't access roads. And so he used that, um, where I think some photographers were actively making an effort to position themselves with the railway behind them. So you didn't realize, and that was one of the things that was interesting when they did the rephotographic survey, was realizing all of the, all of the landscape that was behind and would have been behind the photographers, and he chose to stand in front of it and include it. Mm -hmm. Other museum object? Hmm. You know, I don't remember the name of the artist, but I really love the big white circle downstairs, like a floor. Is that Robin Irwin? Yeah. Okay. Yes. That would be my runner up. And I actually thought of that first, and then, you know, I've been in love with this since I saw it, so, yeah. It's an interesting way to display it, because it's not set upright so anyone can um, look into to see the, the picture. It, it, it more attracts attention to the book-like quality of it than the image within it. Mm -hmm. Well, it's an object. And it's displayed as an object as opposed to just um, laying it out. I'm sure there's also considerations for its um, stability. Other questions? I think I raced through my presentation. So. It becomes a little landscape of its own. That's true. What, what, what uh, kind of photography do you like to do for yourself? Uh, well, I will say the first project that I made when I moved here was actually a landscape project. Um, but I was more interested in the tension between um, the natural landscape and the constructed landscape, whereas I you know, really feel like he's trying to show the integration. Um, I think I've... So you like that Robert Adams work that's downstairs, probably. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yes, exactly. Which I also thought was interesting. In here, you can start to see some of the, um, I don't think I'd ever noticed 
how it appears they've already started to cut the trees just from that angle, but I hadn't noticed it as clearly until looking at the recent Robert Adams installation downstairs. Was yeah. Connections? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that's what I find really fascinating about the way that this um, portion of the museum is rotated on a regular basis. Um, because each time you might see the same image up in succession, but because the theme of the show varies quarterly, it's going to be put in a different context each time. So you might see that same Robert Adams show or that same Robert Adams image in another show on a different topic and then it, it can take on a completely different meaning. Is there contemporary work that's like directly influenced by this today or is it is this most seen as kind of like a historical document that influenced a, kind of a wave of, of things and then things today are sort of tangentially related? Well, I think the way that this actual space right here is displayed speaks to that reference. And I think Robert Adams, whose work is right over there, I think that he was looking at Carlton Watkins. And I think a lot of the work made during this era had to do with the culmination of Manifest Destiny and you know the settlers finally hitting the, the edge of the West Coast. Um, and exploring that, they were using the, the photograph medium to explore the out, outer edges of um, the country at that time. And then Robert Adams is looking at what that looks like now. He's reflecting back on um, what's happened as a result of that or, or in reference to that. Have you looked at the show downstairs yet? Yes. Yeah, that, I thought it was interesting that, that, that comment that, that about how he was uh, uh, really passionate about uh, documenting the, the things that we've uh, done wrong with our land and also uh, 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 celebrating the things that are still so incredibly beautiful about this mm -hmm. part of the country. Right? Mm -hmm. The contrast between the two. One wall is all clear cuts and, the other, uh, and, uh, and uh, logging and the other is, is like coastal scenes. And sure. Yeah, and I think you know one of his projects is called Turning Back, which refers to hitting the, I mean, turning back from the coast and looking back on what has happened. And this is you know early documentation as we arrive in that area. And I think it's also interesting, you know, we've got it, other other images back there on that back wall that were taken mm, close to about the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and they're far more interested in, or at least the images are showing more of the decimation as opposed to the integration. So other people were, were making other kinds of images in that area at that time.